Hello, BookTube. I'm back, and I have four more new titles for you. The first one being uh, A Life Apart by Neil Mukherjee. This is the author of uh, The Lives of Others, which was a wonderful novel, very tough. Uh, and this one, I'll read you a bit of the, uh, the cover copy here. Ridwick Gosh, 22 and recently orphaned, finds the chance to start a new life when he arrives in England from Calcutta. But Oxford holds little of the salvation Ritwick is looking for. Instead, he moves to London, where he drops out of official existence into a shattery hinterland of illegal immigrants. Uh, and uh, the prose, I read this, I read this already, uh, and started to get, uh, it's starting to get a little critical attention, but uh, the prose is sometimes wonderful and sometimes not. I thought I would read you an example of what I mean by that. Uh, in Ritwick's mind, there are two types of poverty. One, the unexperienced sub-Saharan type, some sort of shrine for the Western media with images of devouring eyes, fly-encrusted lips of children, a women and men and offspring reduced to bare, forked animals, a cage of awkward, stubborn bones barely sheathed in polished skin. The other was the slow drip, 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 which did not decimate populations in one fell swoop, but hounded you every fraction of your time, got under your skin, into every space in your head, and made you a lesser person, an edgy, jittery animal, because, you see, it never finished you off, but gnawed at you here and there, just to remind you that it was there and that you were powerless in its half-grip. Now, you can see some of the problems there. First of all, it's not images of devouring eyes. <laughs> As you can tell, because the next word he uses is fly. He means images of eyes being devoured by flies. Not Eyes don't devour things. <laughs> and second, you've got... Uh, in the course of only two lines, uh, one fell swoop and got under your skin, which is lazy, unexamined prose. And it, that, that balance is all throughout this book, where it will be some that paragraph is also brilliant. It, you get a brilliant paragraph that's studded with lazy writing. Uh, this is, despite what I, what I just said, this is a major author. I firmly believe that he will win every literary award in the world as he grows older. Uh, but it was a problematic book. <laughs> Next one, don't know how it got into my inbox. It's, a, it's you're not going to believe it. It's YA. <laughs> it's The Glittering Court by Rochelle Mead. And uh, I thought I would read you just a bit of the plot summary here. Uh, big and sweeping, spanning from the refined palaces of Osfrid to the gold dust and untamed forest of Adoria, The Glittering Court tells the story of Adelaide, an Osfridian countess who poses as her servant to escape an arranged marriage and start a new life in Adoria, the new world. But to do that, she must join the Glittering Court. Both a school and a business venture, the Glittering Court is designed to transform impoverished girls into upper-class ladies who appear destined for powerful and wealthy marriages in the new world. Adelaide naturally excels in her training and even makes a few friends, the fiery former laundress Tamson and the beautiful refugee Mira. She manages to keep her true identity hidden from all but one, the intriguing, the intriguing Cedric Thorne, son of the wealthy proprietor of the Glittering Court. Now, help me count the ways. That <laughs> uh, that is slopping from the same trough that feeds way too much YA fiction. Is this? It's a finishing school for girls, the aim of which is to get married. Her secret is known only to you know, people of a lower social class than her and an enigmatic boy. It's <sighs> Believe it or not, <laughs> I will read this, and I will see if I like it. And the publisher went to the bother and sent it to me. I will read it. I'll report back. Our next one uh, is a book called Relic. It is by William Howell and Terry Moe, and its essential contention is that the United States Constitution is a relic of a bygone agrarian era and needs a change. One particular change they have in mind. Uh, their proposal is that the seldom used and often contested presidential fast track be made a regular part of government. Uh, so far, fast track authority has only been used in the realm of trade policy and only when Congress has chosen to make it available. What, are we, what we are proposing is that fast-track authority be made permanent and that it apply to all policies. This, essentially, is the entire reform. Simple as that. The details, such as they are, 
are those we just discussed. The President would have the right to craft a complete policy and propose it to Congress. Congress would be required to take an up-down vote without amendment within a specified period of time, and the vote in each chamber would be on a majoritarian basis, no filibusters. If Congress failed to follow these steps to the final vote, the President's proposal would become law without Congress's consent. <laughs> I checked to see if the release date for this thing was April 1st. It was not. I checked the bios of the two authors to see if perhaps they were teenagers. They are not. I cannot understand how anyone not strung out on severe psychotropic drugs could think this is a good idea. But maybe these two don't mind that kind of dead man switch authority being in the hands of, for instance, just to take a wild hypothetical, a balding, sexist, racist, reactionary, fascist moron. What if a balding, sexist, racist, reactionary, fascist moron were to be, for instance, ahead in the polls by double digits, a likely candidate for president? Would they still want him to have that authority? And we move straight from theoretical fascism to actual fascism. This is Karl Donitz and the Last Days of the Third Reich. Uh, this is by Barry Turner, and it is about Admiral Donitz, who, uh, unbeknownst to most people, took over the Third Reich after Hitler killed himself. He was Hitler's named successor, and he took the reins of government after the, it was all over when, you know, the whole country was in ruins, the Allies were all around, the Russians were coming in. Uh, he, this is his biography uh, and also a study of his ruling of the Third Reich. Uh, most people don't know the Third Reich had two rulers. <laughs> uh, it's very, very good. I read it in ARC months and months, well, last year. And its release date has been passed around like some sort of three-card Monty cop. I, I think it's finally coming out in April. It might already be out. And it's a difficult subject to study. It's a difficult study, subject to, to write about because Karl Donitz is as, as close as we can come to a good Nazi. He wasn't particularly fond of National Socialism. He wasn't particularly fond of Hitler. He was a, a dyed-in-the-wool Navy man and said at his trial that he shouldn't be tried at all, that he was a soldier doing his best to carry out the military orders on the high seas that he was given. And that opinion was also held by all of his prosecutors on both sides. Uh, he was sent to jail anyway, uh, served a long sentence, and then got out and faded away. People were kind of expecting him to become a major figure in post-war German politics, but he was not interested. He was a military man. Um, it's a complex subject, and it's handled very well in this book. I, uh, I recommend it strongly for those of you who are World War II fans. It's a, it's a book to have. Uh, and that's it. That is uh, four new books to hot off the presses to see if uh, they interest you. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think. And, uh, as of course, I'll be back tomorrow with more. Thank you, BookTube.